Hello friends, this video on biological classification part 13 is brought to you by examfear.com. No more fear from exam. So now we reach to the last group of protista that is protozoa. So protozoa are the animal like protists. So these protozoa will have many close resemblance with animals. So they are considered to be the first animals because so far whatever we have discussed first was monera which included all bacteria. They were unicellular, they were um, prokaryotes. Next we came to protista. In protista again we talked about so many different groups. So now in protozoa group for the first time we are seeing animal like protists. So they, are, they were considered to be the first animals. Now we will discuss about the structure of the protozoa of the different types of protozoa in the different groups because even in protozoa also we have divided them into different groups because again inside protozoa we have many variety of protists. They do not have cell walls. When you talk about their habitat, they have aquatic or moist habitats. Nutrition, they are heterotrophic because they do not have chlorophyll so they cannot perform photosynthesis they are not at all autotrophs they depend only on others for their food now they can be parasitic or predators when i say parasitic what i mean that means it lives inside the body of another living organism and derive its nutrition from that organism that is parasitic what is predator that means it catches prey and ingests it so it catches something and just eats it directly that is predator so it can be parasitic as well as predator they have animal-like nutrition that is holozoic nutrition. What is holozoic nutrition? Direct intake of solid food is known as holozoic nutrition. For example, we human beings also have holozoic nutrition because we take in solid food directly. So that is how they have similarities with animals. Reproduction both asexually as well as sexually. So let us look at the different groups which are going to which we are going to study under protozoa. Amoeboid protozoa, flagellated protozoa, ciliated protozoa, and sporozoa. Now I think all of them are self-explanatory terms because each of them have words which actually explains what they are. So let us quickly talk about the four types of protozoa with some examples of each type. Let us start with amoeboid protozoa. Amoeboid, that means something which is similar to amoeba. Right? So how do they resemble amoeba? In the presence of pseudopodia. And what are pseudopodia? Pseudopodia is nothing but the false feet of amoeba. Right? Pseudopodia are this extension of the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm gets extended to act like a feet. They not only help in locomotion, but it also helps in ingesting food. So some are predators with amoeba-like ingestion of prey. So the presence of pseudopodia is one characteristic of amoeboid protozoa. Another characteristic is they ingest prey with the help of the pseudopodia. So we will see how do they ingest prey. Let us suppose if this is an amoeba and this blue colored structure is a prey. So how do they catch their prey? They extend the cytoplasm. The cytoplasm gets extended like this and the prey is captured inside the amoeba in this fashion and this is how the prey is ingested. And this process is known as phagocytosis. So these type of protozoans also ingest their prey in this fashion. And that is why they are known as amoeboid protozoa because they have two similarities with amoeba. One is the presence of pseudopodia, the other is the ingestion of prey. So when I talk about pseudopodia, it is the false pit, it is temporary extension of cytoplasm. Please remember that the extension is temporary. Helps in locomotion as well as feeding. So here if you see, the, I mean, this uh, extension of cytoplasm definitely helps in crawling and uh, moving from one point to another it also helps in feeding as you can see in this picture so that is about the amoeboid protozoa some of them can be parasitic as well i mean this was the first example was for predator when they ingest their prey that is a predator behavior now they can be parasitic as well that is they can live inside the body of another living organism and obtain their food from them one example is entamoeba histolytica 
which causes a disease called amoebiasis. So it lives in the body of human beings or other primates. So it obtains its nutrition from those human beings. But at the same time, it can cause infection while it stay in the digestive tract. So and infection in the digestive tract can give rise to these, this disease called amoebiasis. So the name of the disease is also derived from the word amoeba. That is why it is amoebiasis. So that's all about amoeboid protozoa. So this is how the entamoeba histolytica look like under the microscope. Let us talk about the flagellated protozoa, so something with flagella. So the protozoa with flagella are flagellated protozoa. Flagella is a single whip-like structure. So they can be free living or parasitic. What do I mean by free living? Free living means it obtains, it, it is heterotrophic. It depends on others for its food, but it is independent. It independently depends on something for its food. It doesn't live inside the body of another living organism. So that is known as free living. So it can be free living or it can be parasitic as well. Example of flagellated protozoa is Trypanosoma gambiens, which can cause these diseases called sleeping sickness. So that means this kind of protozoa is parasitic because it lives inside the human body. So the human body is its host. It's ob it obtains its nutrition from the human body and it can also cause this disease called sleeping sickness. Third is ciliated protozoa, that means protozoa with cilia. What are cilia? So the first was amoeboid. They had pseudopodia, that was false feet or temporary extension of cytoplasm. Next was flagella, that is one single whip-like structure which helps in its movement. Now is cilia. Cilia are nothing but small thread-like hair-like structures, but they are numerous in number. See here you can see small hair-like structures, very light colored. So these are cilia. So they are numerous in number. Hair-like structures arising from the surface of a cell. They are capable of rhythmic motion. So again, cilia also helps in movement. It helps in locomotion. Multiple short cilia exist. Unlike flagella. Flagella is one in number, but cilia are many in number. And what is the purpose of cilia? It helps in movement and it also helps in engulfing food. One best example of ciliated protozoa is paramecium. So here in this picture itself, you are seeing a paramecium. Now, how does the movement of cilia helps in engulfing food? How it helps in the intake of food? Let us try to understand that. This is how the paramecium looks like. So it, it gives a, um, the appearance of slippers. The ladies' slippers which we wear, it, it does, doesn't it look similar to that. Right. Okay. So now if you look at the structure of a paramecium, you see that there is a cavity here. So you see this cavity. This cavity is nothing but the gullet. So gullet is the cavity that actually opens to the outside of the cell surface. So gullet actually acts like how mouth acts for us. For us, mouth opens to the external world, right? So whatever food we take in, we take in through mouth. Similarly, whatever food enters inside the paramecium, it enters through this cavity called gullet. Now, the movement of the cilia causes the water laden with food to be steered into the gullet. Now, when the cilia, the cilia are present all around, somewhat like this. Now, this cilia will keep on moving in such a way that it can push the food through this gullet because the gullet is like a cavity inside. So it is a slopey structure. The movement of cilia will try to push the food towards this gullet and through that gullet it will enter inside the body of the paramecium. So that is how cilia solves two purposes. It helps in movement of the paramecium. It also helps in engulfing food. And the last one that is sporozoans. What are sporozoa? They are non-motile protozoa. So, so far, whatever protozoa we talked about, they were all motile. First, amoeboid, they, they could move with the help of pseudopodia. The next was flagellated, they could move with the help of flagella. The third was ciliated, which could move with the help of cilia. But sporozoa are the ones which cannot move. They are non-motile protozoa. 
They are mostly parasitic, that means they live inside the body of another organism. They reproduce by spore formation and that is why they are known as sporozoa. Their reproduction happens by formation of spores. So spores are formed and then they are carried to different places by different carrying agents like wind, water, other animals. And then those at those different places, those spores germinate to give rise to new organisms. Example is plasmodium which causes the well-known disease malaria in human beings. So plasmodium is a protista or it is a protista and under protista it falls under protozoa. Under protozoa it falls under sporozoa. So these are non motile protozoa. So here you can look at this picture. You can look at um, the microscopic view of the plasmodium. So they are parasitic because they live inside the human body and can even cause infection to make that human being suffer from a disease like malaria. So with this we have reached towards the end of our discussion on protista. So let us quickly review the importance of protists. They are a source of food for many life forms. Now as we go to the higher life forms, we will see that there are a variety of organisms which feed on smaller organisms. So these protists act as a source of food for many other life forms. Not only that, there are certain protists which are capable of producing food, for example diatoms, so they also serve as a source of food for other life forms. So protists are important source of food for many life forms. They are also helpful in medical research. They are also valuable in the industry because they are helpful in uh, making many different substances like ice creams or caramels. So they are also this protista are have got their own significance. So these are some of the um, uh, important advantages of the, uh, of the organisms belonging to the protista kingdom. So with this discussion on protista, so what did we see so far? Two kingdoms we covered. First was Monera, where we spoke about the unicellular uh, prokaryotes. So Monera was all occupied by bacteria. The second was protista, which was occupied by unicellular eukaryotes. So it was occupied by some plants like protists, some fungus like protists and some animal like protists. So they all together formed this kingdom, protista. Thank you. Please visit www.examfear.com to watch more videos, attempt free online test, get free study material, find tutors and mentors. Thank you once again.